Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, my, it's good to see everybody in this afternoon. We even had to put up an extra table, didn't we? So uh, we've got a lot of visitors with us. We've got uh, one, two couples from Florida, and uh, we've got several from the Oklahoma City area. And uh, we're just glad you're here. We just trust you'll enjoy the afternoon. And for those of you joining us on television, in case this is the first time you've ever seen the program, and that happens every day, doesn't it? Every day somebody calls, well, I just caught your program for the first time. Well, if you're one of those, just remember, we're just a simple Bible study. Uh, we don't claim to have all the answers, but uh, we just pray that we can stay centered on the truth of Scripture. Uh, that's why I prefer to keep it non-denominational, because we were just talking over uh, our early breakfast this morning with friends. You know, people will get so hung up on denominationalism that they just get a closed mind to anything else. Well, what if their denomination is wrong? See, ever think of that? What if your denomination isn't exactly on the truth? Hey, you're out of luck, because I think God is absolute. I really do. Uh, I know we can't judge hearts, but uh, God's Word is absolute, and uh, as we've stressed so often, uh, you're either on it, or you're missing it. And so that's all we try to do, is just help people see what the book says, not what I think, not what some denomination thinks, but what does the Word of God really say about it. And uh, again, when I get to this place, I always have to thank our listeners for their letters, their prayers, your financial help. My, the letters again in the last few days have just been so encouraging. And uh, we just find it hard to believe that the Lord is using us. Because I think I've said it before in the program. For the longest time, I felt that if I had any ministry at all, it was to teach believers. But uh, I never considered myself evangelical or a, a soul winner, per se. But, oh, my goodness, the numbers of people that are coming out of just total lostness. And uh, what a testimony, over and over, how that their lives have been changed. Okay, that's enough for introduction. It's high time we get rolling because everybody says, I'm sure glad you don't use music. I'm glad you don't use time even for prayer. We need the Bible study. So we're going into 1 John now this afternoon, chapter 3, and we'll start right at verse 1. Now for those of you out on television, this will be the last two hours of our book number 56. That makes my wife just smile from ear to ear. She wants everybody to know where we are in the book series. This is the last two hours of book 56. All right, verse 1, behold. Well, the very first word, what does that word behold really tell you? Hey, wake up, pay attention. We've got something important to say. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we, as believers. Now, again, I always have to keep reminding people these little epistles of James and Peter and John and Jude and on into Revelation are written primarily to what people? The Jews, the nation of Israel. Now that doesn't mean that we just close it up and say, well, this isn't for us, because all Scripture is profitable. Paul's epistles, of course, are written to us, and that's where we have to find our basic doctrines. But all the rest of Scripture still is applicable in one way or another. So even though John is addressing Jews here, yet you and I can revel in this just as much, that God has loved us so much that we can be called the sons of the children of God. Now you see, Paul uses that same language. Paul says that we're the children of God. So that doesn't make it all in the same kettle, not by any means. They are still on two different platforms, but nevertheless, under the same God, and the Word of God is profitable. All right. Therefore, the world, the world around us, the world system, knoweth us not. Now, I'm sure that every one of you, if you really live and walk and practice your Christian life, once in a while you're going to run up across somebody that thinks you're a little bit odd. They think you're out of it. There's something wrong with you. Well, don't be disheartened. 
It's always been that way. From day one, in fact, I'll probably go back to it sometime along in here, but just as soon as Abel was accepted of the Lord, how did Cain immediately begin to feel about him? Well, he hated him. Why? Because he was a righteous man and Cain wasn't. That's basically what it was. Well, it's the same way here. Now, oh, you ought to see the letters we get. How that when people in a Sunday school class realize that these folks have an understanding of Scripture that the quarterly hadn't even come close to, they look down the row at them as though they've lost it, like they're out of their cage. But that's the way it's always been in the Lord himself. The Lord himself was detested by the religious leaders of the nation because it just rankled them, see? All right, so the world doesn't know who we really are. They don't understand us, but hey, they didn't understand the Lord either. And they knew him not. All right, now verse 2, beloved, now, right here in this life, not what we hope to be, but we know that we are the sons or the children of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now stop a minute. Do you realize that this book tells us very, very little about our eternal state? You just can't find much about what we're going to be doing or what we're going to be uh, active in in eternity. Now we know it's going to be glorious. It's going to be beyond human comprehension. That's as far as I can go. And see, even John says the same thing by the inspiration of the Spirit. We don't know yet what it's going to be like. But this much we can know. And this applies just as much to our looking for the rapture of the church as these Jews who are to be looking for the second coming. Now remember, whenever you're dealing with Israel, whenever you're dealing with the Gospels, early Acts, or in these Jewish epistles, whenever it refers to the next coming of Christ, it's the second coming, not the rapture. Because Israel has nothing to do with the rapture of the church, but they have everything to do with the second coming. All right, so John now is talking about the second coming. And then he says that when he shall appear, that is at his second coming, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, we've done this often enough before, I know, but again, for new listeners' sake, bear with me. Let's come back to Acts chapter 1, where the Lord has just been with the eleven. Judas is gone, Matthias isn't in yet, so that's why I use the number eleven. Back in Acts chapter 1, the Lord has been with the eleven now for forty days. And it's going to be 10 days before the Holy Spirit comes down on Pentecost. So we're on the Mount of Olives at the end of the 40 days. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Acts chapter 1, we're going to jump in at verse 9. So when he had spoken these things, that is to the 11, up there on the Mount of Olives, no press of the crowds, just Jesus and the 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now look what these two angels tell the eleven. Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven. This same Jesus, just exactly as you have known him now for the last 40 days, after his resurrection, where he could be from one place to the next in a split second, where he could enter into a room without benefit of doors or windows, where he had fish and bread waiting for him on the shore and he ate with them. He walked with them. He talked with them. He communicated with them. Now that same Jesus that they had been communicating with for these last 40 days, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go 
into heaven. Well, that's the second coming. That's not the rapture. And so at the second coming, he will return in that same physical resurrected body with which he walked 40 days with the 11. All right, now I always like to tie the new with the old. So now you come back to the Old Testament and you got the same picture. Zechariah chapter 14. <clears throat> Zechariah, the next to last book in your Old Testament. If you can't find it, just find Matthew and go back to the left through Malachi and the next one is Zechariah. Chapter 14. And of course the first three verses are the closing days of the tribulation. The horrors of the wrath and the vexation. Which will end up then with verse 3. That then, when the tribulation is now drawing to a close, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations that have all gathered, remember, in the valley of Megiddo and every place else. As when he fought in the day of battle. In other words, he's utterly going to destroy those armies gathered from around the world. Now verse 4. To culminate that reappearance from heaven, his feet, see, physical. His physical feet shall stand in that day, the day of his second coming, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave or separate in the midst. And then you come on over to verse 9. And as he has now returned and is ready to set up that thousand year reign, verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over what? All the earth, not just Israel. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords over all the earth. See, now that's the second coming. Whereas, now I guess I might as well just stop at 1 Thessalonians on our way back. Stop at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I always do this just for sake of comparison, because most of Christendom has got them all mixed up. I remember several years ago, Iris and I were attending a service, and uh, the uh, speaker was starting out, we thought, the rapture. And then it wasn't long, it was the second coming. And then pretty soon you couldn't tell the difference. Well, I wasn't going to be critical, and I wasn't going to say a word, so we were a long ways down the road, and as a rule, we don't chatter too much when I'm driving, but I had been silent for quite a while, and finally she looked up at me and she says, he had it all mixed up, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he did. You couldn't discern the rapture from the second coming, see? All right, but now here's where you can. Man, anybody that can read can see the difference in the language. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And just for sake of time now, that uh, we'll start in verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Now watch the difference in language. Now this is Paul, of course, with regard to the body of Christ, the end of the age of grace. And he says, for the Lord himself, same Lord as Zechariah spoke of, but in a different time element. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the angel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the resurrection of the church age believers, remember. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. We're not going to meet him on the Mount of Olives. We're going to be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Not on the Mount of Olives, not in Jerusalem, not on the earth. We're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Now, you know, that always reminds me, you know the story of the servant that went to find a bride for Rebecca? I can never separate that from, from our picture of the rapture. I don't know if it was intended to be typical that way, but it certainly is for me. You remember the servant went to find the bride, and I always like to picture that as the Holy Spirit pulling out the believers today. And we're forming the body of Christ day by day. All right, when finally the servant had determined who the bride was to be, 
he was bringing her back to the home tent of Abraham and Isaac. But before the caravan reaches Isaac's tent, what has Isaac done? Well, he's gone out to meet it. And so someplace from the place where they consummated their marriage, someplace between the home of the bride and the home of Isaac, they met. And then, you know, the, the last verse of that chapter says that Isaac took Rebekah back to his tent and he loved her. Now, if that doesn't bring tears to your eyes, I don't know what can. But see, same way here. The Lord is going to come, but we're going to go up to meet him. Just like Isaac left to meet his bride, we're going to leave to meet the Lord in the air. See? And then so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, it could just as well say, like it does back in Genesis, and so will we ever, what? Love him. Love him. Because after all, he's the God of love. And we're going to be part and parcel of that agape love. Okay, now let's come back, if you will, then, to 1 John again, chapter 3. So that, verse 2, that when he shall appear at his second coming, not the rapture, the second coming, that even for those Jews who I think, and again, I don't get dogmatic on some of my uh, approaches to prophecy and so forth. But I think these Jews that are going to see him at his second coming will be that remnant of Israel out there in the wilderness. Now, you remember, we've always taught that, that at the middle of the tribulation, there's going to be that escaping remnant of Israel out into the mountains, and God's going to protect them for three and a half years. Well, those are the Jews that I think are going to see him coming in all the clouds of glory. And in a moment, that's what I think the scripture means it's when it says that a nation will be born in a day. When those Jews out in the wilderness will see him coming in the clouds of glory, and they shall see him as he is, then every one of them will suddenly believe. But, John here is not talking about that group of Jews. He's talking about these who are living and to whom he's writing. Now, you remember we've been stressing over the last many months of programs now that in these little Jewish epistles of James and Peter and John, they were all expecting everything to happen in their lifetime. They were expecting the tribulation to come, and they were expecting to live through it until they would see the second coming of Christ, and be able to go into the kingdom. They had no idea that there would be a 2,000-year hiatus. And so John is writing in that same vein that they were to momentarily expect the horrors of the tribulation and then the second coming. And they would see him as he is. All right, now then, verse 3. Just as appropriate for us today as it was for the Jews to whom John is writing. Every man, now that's a generic term, we're including men and women, boys and girls. So every person that hath this hope, the soon appearing. Now for the Jews, yes, it was going to be after the seven years of tribulation. But seven years isn't long for a great event like this to happen. And so they were to be looking for him and they were to purify themselves with that hope, even as he is pure. What does it mean? Well, they were to be so expectant for his return that they would have their spiritual house in order. Now, you know, I've given the illustration down through the years. Some of you will say, well, I'm not that good a housekeeper. Some of you are almost the other extreme. But I think most of you ladies, when you know that company is coming, what do you do? Well, you get your house ready to one extent or another. You're going to have your house in an appropriate order for company. You know, that's why we appreciate people giving us five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just human nature that you want things in order when company comes. Well, no, that's how we're to treat the Lord's coming. He may come before we get out of here this afternoon. 
Is your spiritual house clean? Are you ready for it? If not, you better be. Well, the Jews here were being told the same thing. His coming is not that far down the road. Get your spiritual house in order. Be ready for him. And that, as a consequence, it purifies our Christian walk. Now, see, a lot of people, now I'm going to come back into the whole concept of the rapture. A lot of people today have got the idea, well, it doesn't really matter what they do because the grace of God will cover it and God will be uh, condescending enough. Will he? That's no guarantee. And so it behooves every believer, every believer, every moment of every day to be ready. He may come before we're out of here. And you don't want to be caught in a compromising situation. You don't want to be caught in some place that's dishonoring to the Lord. I'd hate to be. And so it's a constant reminder to us as well as it was for these Jews. And it had a purifying effect on their everyday life. All right, now we come to the sin situation as John is going to deal with it. Now, sin has been sin ever since the Garden of Eden, hasn't it? All right, in verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law. Now he's talking about the Mosaic law, of course. For sin is the transgression or the breaking of the law. That's what sin is. Sin is breaking God's law. All right, let's go back and see how Paul approaches the very same thing. Come back to Romans chapter 3, where Paul deals with that aspect of the law. And here's how he puts it. Romans chapter 3, coming in at verse 19. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now, whether it's Paul or whether it's John, doesn't make any difference. Not in this case, because, you see, the law is God's standard for the human race and a transgression of it, God calls sin. All right, verse 19. Now we know, Paul says, that whatsoever things the law saith, the Ten Commandments, it saith to them who are under the law. In other words, Israel was the only people on earth who were under the system of law. I just about said religion, which of course would have been appropriate, but nevertheless, only Israel was under the religious system of law. But the holiness of the law, the omnipotence of the law, if I may call it that, because it's, it's God-given, didn't stop at the borders of Israel, it went to the whole world. Even though they were not under the religious system of law. Go on in the verse. So it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth, not just Israel's, but that every mouth may be stopped and all the world, every human being, may become not righteous, not ready for heaven, but what? Guilty. Because all the world is breaking God's law. And if they're breaking God's law, they're guilty. If they're guilty, they're what? They're sinners. See how it all figures? All right, verse 20. <clears throat> Therefore, by the deeds of the law, or keeping the commandments, no flesh shall be justified, because it's impossible. So no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of, here's the word, what? Sin. Sin. That's all the Ten Commandments can do is show us our sin. Show us that we're lawbreakers. See, that's why I cannot see that the Ten Commandments have anything to do with the separation of church and state. I just can't reconcile it. The Ten Commandments have actually nothing to do, basically, with church. The Ten Commandments are God's moral law not just for Christians, but for the whole human race. You take the Ten Commandments and they are just as valid to a Hindu as they are to a Muslim or anybody else. It's the law of the sovereign 
gone. It had nothing to do with church per se. The only where the church comes in that we can bring law-breaking sinners to a knowledge of salvation. But that's not the law's role. The law is just simply to show mankind God's moral compass. That's what it is. All right? Now then, I think that's enough for there. Let's come back again to 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. Now we know, or you, he says, you know that he was manifested. He was brought into the spotlight of history. He was manifested to take away our sin. Now let me stop here a minute again. I don't spend a lot of time in the Gospels precisely because that's where most of you spend your time in Sunday school and church, so why should I bother? But really, if you stop to think, what was Jesus constantly confronting the Pharisees and the religious leaders with? I'll have to end with a preposition. Pardon me. What was he constantly confronting them with? Their sin. Their sin. Don't you know that over and over he would tell them, you are still in your sins? That's what they didn't like. They didn't like to be told that they were sinners, but they were. They were rotten sinners in spite of all their religion. And why? Because they were constantly breaking the law. And when you break the law, you're sinning. It's that simple. All right, back to our text. He was manifested to take away man's sin. That's why he dealt with it constantly in his earthly ministry. And he could do that because in him is what? No sin. Now you see the blasphemers of our day, and they're getting more and more numerous, are trying to tell us what? That he sinned like anybody else. No, he did not. He did not sin, not even a thought. Because, you see, had he committed as much as one single sinful thought, he could not have been that Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world because the Lamb had to be without blemish. Goodness sakes, we're all through for this half hour. Okay, we'll pick it up in the next half hour. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.